at some point in your walk with Jesus, you're going to have to stop fighting to explain everything. If you can explain everything you see God do, you're not seeing God do very much. And if you're not seeing God do very much, it's not because he can't. It's because you've chosen control. Man's problem with the Holy Spirit really isn't with the Holy Spirit. It's really about control. We're afraid to yield, to give up control. You can partner with the Holy Spirit anytime you want. And here would be my question for you. If when Mary chose to partner with the Holy Spirit, it led to giving birth to the Savior of the whole world, what might happen if you choose to partner with the Holy Spirit? What might the Holy Spirit do with and through you? We're kicking off a new series this weekend. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. That may give you some kind of a heads up as to the series we're jumping into. From now until June, we're going to be in a series on the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, not the Holy Spirit as a doctrine, but the Holy Spirit as the third member of the Trinity. Now, here's what I know. I know that some of us, when we hear his name, the blood pressure starts to go up just a little bit. That's part of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I'm going to help you understand possibly why that's the case. Now, I've known I was going to jump into this series since December. And uh, <laughs> honestly, I thought I knew exactly what week number one was going to be entitled. Literally for months, I've been thinking, here's how the, the Holy Spirit series is going to start this year. The, the title of the series is The Holy Spirit Is. And every week, that's actually the title of the message, and we're going to fill in the blank. All right? The Holy Spirit is fill in the blank. All right? So I've been operating for months and months thinking this is how it's going to go. Week number one, I'm going to lay out the case with a message entitled the Holy Spirit is not weird. <laughs> because if you, if you have grown up in the spirit-filled uh, portion of the evangelical world, like I have, uh, my spirit-filled brethren and sisterin have spent the better part of their lives trying to make a case that the Holy Spirit is not weird despite misconceptions and what you think you know about him. And then I got to this week, and how many of you know that God rarely, if ever, does what you think he's going to do? Anybody ever, ever learned that? Okay, well, let me tell you what the title of this week's message actually is. The Holy Spirit is weird. <laughs> Not how I expected it to go. But let me help you understand what the definition of the word weird is. It might surprise you to know that our friend Webster defines the word weird as related to or connected to the supernatural. See, when I said the Holy Spirit is weird, some of us were thinking about how we use that word. And here's how we use the word weird. What we mean to say is, odd in an unlikable way. So we say it like this about somebody. That person is weird. We, we squint our eyes and we scrunch our nose. That person is weird. And what we're saying is that person is odd in an unlikable way. Okay, that's not the definition of weird I am using to say the Holy Spirit is weird. The Holy Spirit is the supernatural one moving on the earth today. And here's what I would ask. No matter what your perspective or opinion or misconceptions about the Holy Spirit are, here's what I'm asking for the next couple months of your life. Will you lay all of that down and let the Holy Spirit teach you about the Holy Spirit? Not just me. I, I, listen, I don't want you just listening to me. I, I am praying and interceding through this whole series that you hear the spirit of God's voice more than you hear mine. And I get excited every time I teach on the Holy Spirit because I know the Holy Spirit's gonna show me some new things about himself 
that I don't yet know. Three questions in this message, all right? And the first two deal with this weird narrative. And then the last question deals with you. All right, so let's jump in. Question number one, when did the weird narrative begin? Because some of us think that the Holy Spirit is weird and spirit-filled people are weird narrative started about 30 years ago when a group of less than healthy followers of Jesus started to attempt to walk out the things of the spirit in a less than scriptural way. That's what many of us think. No, 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 I'm gonna show you in the Bible that this weird narrative actually started 2000 years ago on day one, Pentecost. Acts chapter two, we're gonna read 13 verses because I want you to see it in context and hopefully you have your Bible and you can read it with me. Acts chapter two, starting in verse one. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Heart rates for a few are already raising right now. Verse five, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the, the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, and Arabs. I should get extra credit from my professors in college just for doing that run right there. I probably butchered half of them, but it's okay. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. Watch verse 13. Here's the narrative. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. Satan created a narrative of drunkenness on day one when the Holy Spirit fell upon man in a way man had never seen it happen heretofore. And Satan creates a narrative of drunkenness. Those people are off their rocker. And here was his goal, dormancy. Dormancy. Isn't it interesting, Satan also used a couple of people and another very large crowd to utter a few simple words just like this. Remember the words? Crucify him. Crucify him. Two words. Help lead to his death. Just a few more words than that have led to, in some ways, the Holy Spirit's death as it relates to activity in the life of believers all over the earth. And what is really at the core of this narrative? It's really connected to man's insecurity. It's this whole guilty by association thing. Those people are off their rocker. Do you wanna be considered off your rocker? then don't do what they're doing and don't run with them. It's actually just a play on man's insecurity. I don't know if you know this, but the this condition of man is such that mankind experience, experiences gross insecurity 
all the time. In the fact, you could say the average human is so insecure that the perception of man is more important to them than the power of the spirit. An example of this guilty by association thing. Remember Peter denying Jesus three times? Isn't it fascinating that he didn't deny Jesus because someone held a gun to his head? And I'm going to say this, and I don't mean to disrespectfully, but just to kind of over-dramatize what it was. No one was holding a gun to his head. It was a little girl. It was his insecurity and a fear of being connected to someone and something not everybody understood. Now, before you start bashing Peter and going, I can't believe he denied Jesus. Let me just remind you of this. One of Jesus' disciples denied Jesus three times and we're all still talking about it. Yet many of Jesus' disciples denied the Holy Spirit and none of us are talking about it. Guilty by association. Man, are you one of those Holy Spirit people? Are you one of those Spirit-filled people? No, nah, man, I'm a follower of Jesus. As if we could separate members of the Godhead. No, nah, man, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Here's the problem with that line of reasoning. It is impossible to be a follower of Christ and not be led by the Holy Spirit. And yet many try and separate the two. And we're going to talk a lot in this series about things Jesus said about the Holy Spirit that will blow your mind. Essentially, there are two ways to live as a follower of Jesus as it relates to this conversation. You're either going to wake up every day of your life with this thought, but what will people think of me? Or you're going to wake up every day of your life thinking, but what might God do? if I no longer care what people think about me. This weird narrative didn't start 30 years ago. It's a demonic narrative started by the enemy on day one when the Holy Spirit fell in a new way. That brings us to question number two. Why is the weird narrative still a thing? It hasn't gone away. Why is it still a thing? Two answers. Here's the first one. Man craves control. The whole Holy Spirit is weird narrative is still a thing because man craves control. Let me say it like this. Man's problem with the Holy Spirit is not with the Holy Spirit. Man's problem with the Holy Spirit is actually a problem over control. It's an issue of control. Because man loves control so much, man struggles with giving God control. Why? Well, if you do a, a brief little study about authority and dominion, it goes all the way back to Genesis 1. Remember when Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are having a conversation. Everything is perfect. Everything was perfect. And yet, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had something they wanted. You. Do you remember the conversation? Let us make man in our image, right? But do you remember the next words between the three of them? Let me read them to you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion, authority, What's another word for that? A measure of control. Let them have authority, dominion over the fish of the sea. Let them have dominion over the birds of the air. Let them have dominion over the cattle. Let them have dominion over all the earth. Let them have dominion over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Do you get the point? 
Man was created to carry a measure of authority on the earth and God was the one that delegated it to man. But man lost that dominion when he chose sin over obedience to God. But, but let's just do a little bit of a deep dive for a minute. Think of how genius this move was. How did man lose his measure of control on the earth? Sin, right? But how did that go down? Let me give you another way to look at the apple. The sneaky snake slithers in, Preston's paraphrase, and says, you were created for control. But he didn't give you total control. He told you you could eat from any of these trees. But if you were really in control, you could eat from all of the trees. Not just all, but two. You want to show him who's really in control? Eat from that tree. Satan got man to give up his delegated authority by getting him and her to chase total control. And ever since they lost it, man has been white knuckling every area of life without realizing they're simply trying to regain the measure of authority they were created to carry from day one. And so the earth is filled with control freaks. Welcome to church. <laughs> Satan got man to give up control by chasing after total control. Question, how do you know you're addicted to control? I can't linger here for too long, but just for any of us who are control freaks who pretend we're not, how, how does one know they're, they're a control freak? First, you have a fear of the unknown. That's one of the fastest ways to spot someone who needs control in an ungodly manner. They're freaked out by the unknown. Think about it like this. Don't you think it's divinely ironic and sarcastic that the walk of a follower of Jesus is to be by faith? Preston's paraphrase. Hey, bud, you're going to want control constantly. But I'm not always going to give you all the answers. And nothing is ever going to go exactly the way you want. Because it's the only way you'll stay close to me. Because if I gave you total control, you'd convince yourself you have no need for me. And yet we fight to control every area of our lives. Here's another way that you know you struggle with control. You need explanations all the time. Now, listen to me. I'm not telling you to turn your brain off. Be a Berean. Dig into the word. Don't just take what you hear from someone and just go, oh, that must be true. I'm not telling you to turn your brain off, but I'm also saying when you follow a mysterious God whom you will never be able to wrap your limited mind around because he is limitless, at some point in your walk with Jesus, you're going to have to stop fighting to explain everything. Let me say it like this. If you can explain everything you see God do, you're not seeing God do very much. And if you're not seeing God do very much, it's not because he can't. It's because you've chosen control. Because humans crave control, they call it normal when a person is in total control. And they call it abnormal when a person gives God total control. Man's problem with the Holy Spirit really isn't with the Holy Spirit. It's really about control. We're afraid to yield, to give up control. Second reason that the, the spirit-filled people are crazy, the Holy Spirit is crazy narrative is still a thing, is even bigger than the first, because Satan loves conquering. 
The follower of Jesus who is not led by the Spirit poses very little threat to the kingdom of darkness. Think about it like this. The devil isn't afraid of you. But the devil most certainly is afraid of the Holy Spirit moving in you and through you. Here's where I felt like the Lord gave it to me this week. It was in a line. Satan watched what happened with Mary. Now, let me read it to you. If you're in Acts 2, flip back a couple of books to the book of Luke, chapter 1. The angel visits Mary, lets her know she has won the lottery. She's going to give birth to baby Jesus. Apparently, she's freaking out at the sight of the angel, like most of us, if not all of us, would. Don't be afraid, Mary, verse 30 says, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Watch this, because you would ask this question too. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. How can I have a baby? I've never had sex before. I don't know if someone needs to explain it to you, angel, because clearly you're pure. But you can't be getting pregnant if someone doesn't impregnate you. How am I, a little teenage Jewish girl who has never experienced sexual intercourse, how am I going to get pregnant? Watch the angel's answer. The angel replied, want to know how this is going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. If a little teenage Jewish girl does that partner with the Holy Spirit. Last Sunday, which we celebrated, is just another dark Sunday. But because she did partner with the Holy Spirit, we are still celebrating what went down 2,000 years later. Listen, Mary was not meant to be worshiped. Luke chapter 11, Jesus teaches us this. Somebody comes up to him and it sounds like the right thing. And and they say, blessed is the womb who carried you. And Jesus is like, stop now. And he goes on a run and says, no, no, let me tell you who's blessed. Mary was never meant to be worshiped. Having said that, Mary was meant to show every child of God the powerful potential of partnering with the Holy Spirit. And Satan was watching it all go down. We don't chase miracles, but we do walk with the one who frequently does them. And you can partner any time you want with God's Holy Spirit. You can partner with the Holy Spirit in your marriage. Frustrated with your spouse? Why don't you partner with them? Do not look to your left or right right now. (laughs) Don't grunt. Don't make a noise. Lock on me and don't even act like I am partnering with you right now. Frustrated with your spouse? Why not partner with the one who was actively involved in creating them in his own image? Frustrations with your team? Partner with the Holy Spirit who is actively involved in fashioning her in his own image and likeness. Trouble in the workplace? With somebody who's in control over you? Why not partner with the one who has all power in heaven and on earth. You can partner with the Holy Spirit anytime you want. 
And here would be my question for you. If when Mary chose to partner with the Holy Spirit, it led to giving birth to the Savior of the whole world, what might happen if you choose to partner with the Holy Spirit? What might the Holy Spirit do with and through you? This leads to probably the most important one-liner of this whole series. I felt the Lord give me this years ago, and I'm going to teach it until I die because it was very revelatory for me personally. If I were the devil, you know what I would do? Before salvation, I would do everything within my power to keep you away from Jesus. But after salvation, I would do everything in my power to keep you away from the Holy Spirit because I saw what happened when that little girl partnered with him. And I don't want to experience what might happen if you partner with him. And so I'm gonna try and convince all of you that he is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and you shouldn't want anything to do with them. And yet the one you adore and call yourself a follower of said, everything I do, I do by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you were to ask him, how how important was the Holy Spirit to you? He's the reason I got up. See, we, we quote it as the same power which raised Christ from the dead. That's sneaky. That's not what scripture says. The same spirit, capital S, who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. It's sneaky and it is genius. And the reason the narrative still exists is this right here. Satan's number one fear is man's partnership with God. This is why he fights the way he does. And this is why he spent 2,000 years strengthening this demonic narrative. Because he's afraid that if you partner with the Holy Spirit, what happened with Mary will happen with you. I'm not being literal, by the way. You're not about to have a baby. (laughs) Don't take that out of context. That brings us to question number three, and we'll be done. Very simple but difficult question. Will you be weird? So the Holy Spirit is divinely supernatural. Will you be? There are two options every believer has as it relates to the Holy Spirit. You either restrict him or you release him. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 teaches us this. Do not, I love the way the NIV translates this. You probably memorized it a different way. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. You probably memorized it. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. But what does that actually mean? Well, I read it to you in Acts 2. When the Holy Spirit fell upon those in the upper room, it was like flames of fire. The Holy Spirit and fire, and I'm going to show you in, in several passages, but the way the NIV says it, do not put out the Holy Spirit's fire. Okay, so if you're going to see the Spirit of God released in your life rather than restricted in your life, there are three things I want to submit to you that you're going to have to do. Number one, you got to remove the firewall. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. Why is that important? Let me try and illustrate it for you. In a prayer like this, Holy Spirit, do whatever you want to do. Dot, dot, dot. As long as it looks the way I want it to. 
that's not actually a prayer. That's a restriction. Every Christian gives their life to Jesus. But not every Christian gives the Holy Spirit access to every part of their life. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist comes on the scene and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. We just saw that celebrated today. But he who is coming after me, speaking of Jesus, is mightier than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now we're going to talk about this later in the series. All right. But John the Baptist says, Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay. Anybody know what the word baptize literally means? Total immersion. Not partial immersion, dunking. Total immersion. Okay, when Hebrews 12 says, our God is an all-consuming fire. Here's the picture, and this is very important to understand with the Holy Spirit. Too many followers of Jesus say to the Spirit of God, hey, I wanna be, I wanna be baptized by Jesus, and I wanna be baptized with fire. But here's the deal, I'm gonna put up a fence you just stay inside the fence. I ain't got any time to be looking crazy now, Holy Spirit. So you just stay in your, you know what this is like? This is gonna be a hard picture to stomach. But when we draw a firewall for the Spirit of God to stay within, it is like attempting to put a leash on the God of the universe. Sit, Ubu, sit. Stay. No, no. No, I will not in aisle four tell that single mother that word of knowledge you just gave me. She'll think I've done lost my mind. Sit. Stay. Don't talk. This is what we do. And we actually think it's okay. Because somewhere along the line, we started believing the narrative that the Holy Spirit was altogether different than the Father and the Son. And while we would never talk to the Father that way, for some reason, we think it's okay to talk to the Holy Spirit that way. I know we don't literally say sit, but in our hearts, we say, here's the boundary, don't cross it. If you're going to see the Spirit of God released in your life, you're going to have to remove the firewall. The Holy Spirit cannot have his way while you are always fighting to get your way. Here's the second thing you're going to have to do. Follow the fire, not your flesh. Another way to say that, obedience. The evidence of total immersion is total obedience. Galatians 5.25, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. The fastest way to quench the spirit is to disobey him. A pattern of disobedience will create an absence of partnership. You cannot be intimate with God's spirit and disobey him at the same time. Jesus taught us that. You are my friends if you do what I command. Obedience. If you're going to see the Holy Spirit unleashed in your everyday life, going to have to follow his leading in every area of life. And that brings us to the third thing. If you're going to see the spirit of God released in your life rather than restricted, you're going to have to fan the flame. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 says something very powerful to young Timothy. He says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Now, this is one of those funny verses, kind of like the thorn in Paul's side, where believers try and figure out what was the gift Timothy received when Paul laid his hands on him. I don't think that's actually the most important question. Because think about it. No matter what ministering gift of the Holy Spirit Timothy received, who's the giver of the gifts of the Spirit? The Spirit is. Let me show you. 
This is most importantly, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, I believe helps us understand what it was Timothy received, just like all of us. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Peter's on a heater right now in Acts 2. People start getting saved left and right. He says, and, and you must be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God is the giver of good gifts. And the Holy Spirit is one of the best gifts any believer in Jesus will ever receive. And Paul says, you're going to get a fire, but you need to make sure you fan that flame. What if I gave you a fire, like a campfire, and I said, this fire is the key to your whole life. As long as this fire stays lit, you will live. But the minute this fire goes out, you will die. How would you treat that fire? Some of y'all would go in full on techie mode. You put a camera on that thing as if it were like the eagle's nest that was having babies and you would watch that camera at all times. You'd be in a meeting watching your phone to see if that fire was lit. And if it looked like it was about to go out, you wouldn't even tell anybody what you were doing. You would jump out of that meeting, race home, and fan that flame. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is a fire Jesus lights, but also a fire the follower of Jesus must keep lit. The question isn't, is the Holy Spirit divinely and powerfully supernatural weird? The question is, like Jesus, will you be? I hope you were blessed by this message, and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how He used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.